I had a pretty interesting experience um, this morning uh, where pretty much everything that can go wrong went wrong with technology, with my presentation and everything and I ended up having a stand-up comedy improvised together with uh, the host. So uh, I feel pretty relaxed <laughs> right now. Um, this is a picture of someone who loved working with kids. Sadly, I never got to know her because she got sick when I was three and passed away when I was seven. A friend Daniel recently asked me, Carl, why do you do what you do? One of those hard questions. And I was a bit caught off guard, so I came up with some typical answer like, I want to change the world or I want to make the world a better place. But Daniel just looked at me deep in the eyes and said, Oh, I don't think so. I think you're doing this for your mother. I think you want to give something back to her. And maybe he's right. What I do know for sure that is that I want to give every kid a meaningful education, and I want it to be the complete opposite of the education that I had. See, my education was filled with answers, not questions. It was filled with reading books, not writing them. Studying science, not doing science. Learning about math and never getting to apply it. Reading about robotics and never building a single robot. You know, I met a principal once that said, if you ask 10 to 12 year old children about their dream school, most of them will answer, well, I would just like to get a, get a chip with everything I need to know, and then I just put it in my head, and then I'm done. And I think this is pretty interesting because it tells a lot about our society's expectation on education. That is just to take a bunch of facts and abilities, like reading and writing, and then just program them into the heads of the children. So, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, if you think about your most memorable and fun learning experience, and then you think, did it look something like this picture? Or maybe something more like this. Now the title of this talk is Kids Are Makers, So Let Them Make. But I would rather change it to Kids Are Makers and Have the Right to Remain So. Kids love making stuff because it's fun. It comes natural for them. It uh, involves a sense of play and exploration. And you never know exactly where you're going to end up. And that uh, applies for us too. Actually, this is the name of our first customer. Uh, I don't know if you know what tits means in uh, English, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're going to have to live with this. But despite uh, their name, Tom Tits is actually an amazing science center. And they have this really great quote at the entrance of their venue, which I love. You don't stop playing because you grow older. You grow older because you stop playing. Now, I'm a firm believer in the value of play. So let me ask you this. You could make your own robot that you could play with. What kind of robot would you like to make? Now kids are really good at answering this kind of question because they have a really vivid imagination. So maybe you want to make a, like a stubborn robot that never learns. Or, or perhaps you want to make a robot that's overly excited for no reason and that loves to dance <laughs> or maybe you want to make a robot that uh, has some random tics and is sort of stressed out. Now we started asking this question at Kids Hack Day in our lab in Stockholm. We asked the kids this question uh, for them to be able to put their own aspirations into the projects that they were making so that they could feel complete ownership of their own learning. Now, uh, something that has helped us a lot uh, is something called open source hardware. Uh, this kind of le really immersive learning experience with technology has actually become increasingly accessible thanks to platforms and recent developments in platforms such as Arduino which uh, is an amazing enabler to produce new content and new tools for education. 
And for us, it, ha it has helped us a lot in getting kids into programming without really having to teach them any programming. Because the fact is that kids don't want to learn programming. Yes, that's, I said it. <laughs> they don't want to learn programming. They want to make their own video game or make their own whatever they uh, can imagine. This kid, his name is Villa. Uh, when I asked him, because I'm fascinated by his uh, ability to, he programs his own games in Java and he started learning programming when he, when he was seven. And I asked him this question, why, why do you, did you think it was so fun? This was his answer. Well, I, I never enjoyed it. I just wanted to make a video game. And then I had to learn it. And now he's enjoying it. So, uh, that's the thing. The kids want to make their own thing. Um, whether it's a video game or sort of a quirky robot that can do different things. Mankind has always been playing with and making his own toys. And there was a time when kids just went out into the forest using only their hands, their imagination, and whatever was at their disposal to make anything and everything they could imagine. I'm sure you all can relate to this uh, sort of equation. <laughs> you put a kid in the forest and some item from the forest and you have a space shuttle. Um, the thing is that um, ever since Aristotle and the old Greeks and the history of the academic institution, there's been a great divide between theoretical and practical knowledge, between that of knowing and that of making. Academics have often been criticized for sitting in an ivory tower with no connection to the real world, whereas more practical studies like craftsmanship has often been frowned upon by the academic institution, the institutions they inhabit. Now, this, uh, this uh, great divide is very present in our educational system today. And this is a big problem. Because if, there, if there's anything that comes natural to kids, and I'm going to repeat myself here, it's making things with their hands. So when I was a kid, I loved building stuff. But living alone with my dad, and uh, I, I started taking school very seriously. I quickly learned how the system worked, and I only focused on getting good grades. And as the more hands-on and process-oriented learning diminished, so did my curiosity and creativity. Now, there is a sea of research proving the superior effectiveness of hands-on learning. And this is where we are at Kids Hack Day. Now, I'm not saying, you know, we should, like, crafts and aesthetics should take up more space in the curriculum on the expense of, say, math and languages. But rather, we should use hands-on activities as the very starting point for education, and not as a mere complement. Now, a recent study out of Stanford shows that we are talking about the flipped classroom, so doing video lectures at home and doing hands-on activities in school. But there is more research showing that you should also do hands-on activities first, and then complement it with video lectures at home. Um, so let me give you a scenario just to point out what I mean. And I'm going to do it about robotics, because I've, for some reason, uh, since the last year, I've become completely obsessed with robots. So, <laughs> um, so you want to teach kid, a kid about robotics. So you hold a lecture, uh, you give the kid homework, uh, to read up on some simple concepts. The next day you give the kid an instruction manual and you say, build this robot. Or, you have a robot party. And you build a bunch of different robots that can do different things. And you expose the kids to this thing. And then you ask the kid, if you could make your own robot, what kind of robot would you like to make? Now which of these two scenarios do you think works best for learning? After all, what we want to achieve with education is some kind of learning outcome, right? So, um, basically, you have, to, you have to do the hula hula dance and fail uh, <laughs> before you can learn to dance, because that's how we learn in your life. Um, 
Now, of course, there are also other amazing digital tools that can uh, provide this kind of immersive lear learning experience. And one of those is Minecraft. Now, for, for those of you who don't know what Minecraft is, it's kind of like first-person digital Legos. Uh, and it has no purpose. It's like a sandbox. You go and you build whatever you want. Um, and we've been really inspired at Kids Active by Minecraft because it's completely open-ended and it, it's extremely flexible and you can adapt it to any learning context and learning outcome that you want to achieve. So you want to get kids into coding. How do you do coding? Well, you uh, use a Minecraft mod that only allows them to build things, sending programming commands to the, to the server. So allowing them to build all sorts of, sorts of crazy things. This is a screenshot from some of our kids. The, all of this stuff has been built sending programming commands to the server. So they were not allowed to use Minecraft in the, in the normal way. So we kind of tricked them you know, to <laughs> learn the program. Um, but of course, at Kids Active, we love physical things, things that you can touch. Um, so what we did was uh, we, we took the, the things that they had created we uh, let them uh, export it into a 3D model and then print it in a 3D printer. We also work with um, getting them exposed to the ability to interact with Minecraft and control, to control the physical world through Arduino. Now the thing is, we were still sort of stuck in Minecraft. Um, and we, we really wanted to find a physical representation of Minecraft. But since we were competing with ones and zeros, uh, something digital with sort of zero marginal cost, we had to find a really cheap and abundant building material, like regular drinking straws, and make that programmable too. So about uh, a year ago, we partnered up with a Swedish company called Strawbees. They are a toy startup, and they make this really simple uh, plastic construction toy that allows you to connect straws to each other to create both large-scale static structures and dynamic structures. And we started developing an electronics module for this system that you could program, built on top of Arduino. And our goal was to merge robotics with crafts, art, music, and storytelling. Because if, uh, by doing this, we could create something that, uh, we could create the strongest motivation for the kids to want to learn about and explore technology on their own. So, <clears throat> That's like, um, so the first idea for this electronics module came at an event uh, in Sackley, Sydney, uh, which happened in December 2013. And I was hacking, or as we say, transforming uh, an old Christmas toy uh, into something else. And the kids wanted to turn it into a propeller using the strawbies. And later that day, some kids even started interacting with the straws and putting it on the other interactive projects that we had been making. So it, it was then that I realized that if there, only there is a fun, simple, and accessible way for kids to build their own interactive projects using normal drinking straws as the basic building blocks. <laughs> so we created QuirkBot, a hackable toy for all ages allowing you to build your own interactive projects, uh, build and program your own robots using normal drinking straws. Now, uh, I've, I've always dreamt of building a robot on the TED stage. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm gonna do that. Um, also, I'm, because I'm a bit crazy. Uh, so I have here the brain of a robot. So I'm going to take that out. I'll throw this away to someone. It's an alligator clip. It's the best thing in the world. <laughs> <All right. coughs> this is the brain. Um, this is the sort of tail and uh, the, uh, uh, the motor, the neck, and the head. This one has... Uh, uh, it also has this uh, gaffas <laughs> and little nose. Uh, so here I have the body. I put the motor into the body. These are all created with 
Robbies and straws. I have some legs. Put the legs onto the body. I lock it like this. This is a bit nerve-wracking. <laughs> what if it's not going to work? <laughs> So this is the simplest robot. Okay. Now, this we call a backpack. You can have different backpacks uh, to add different functions. It's a motor backpack. So we need to give this little creature some superpower so he puts on his backpack. And in different ways depending on the friction. So I put it on the carpet. I'm not sure how well it's going to walk here. It's going to turn a bit, you know, very unpredictable. You don't know how it might fall off. You put it on the floor. It's, uh, it can do a break dance. Let's see. So you trim it, you can trim it with, uh, in different ways. You can change the uh, speed, uh, you can change the uh, size, uh, the length of the legs, and you can make it move uh, in different ways. So, um, yeah, well that's, that's that robot. Uh, so during the last two years, um, we've been running technology workshops for kids in 16 different countries uh, on six different continents. And we've seen firsthand what happens when you give kids tools to become creators of technology. Um, but the goal is not for kids to learn to program, it's to learn to not be programmed. And with my mother have been alive today, I think that she would have agreed with me. Because if there was anything that she was against, it was the programming of people through doctrine and narrow-minded thinking. So I encourage you to join us in this quest, so together we can create new and meaningful learning experiences for our kids that uses technological capabilities as a tool for creative expression where curiosity and empathy are essential, and where kids learn by making. Because in the end, we are all makers. We all have the right to remain makers. So let's give the, the kids the tools to make their own world, not just consume.